Okay, so good day to everyone. Uh, I'll still introduce myself shortly. So I'm Karolina Rayala. Uh, I come from Finland. My background is majorly in journalism and research. Uh, previously, I've been working with the Ministry of Defense in Finland as a research assistant. And now I've been working on a new publication for the National Defense University of Finland um, related to the topic that I'm going to discuss today. Um, but to start off with, I would still like to thank Alexander uh, for including me in the Fellows Program and giving me the opportunity to present here today. Um, and then maybe it's just shortly about today's topic. Uh, so if you get more interested in this, um, we actually just published a report in English in Finland about the future security scenarios of Russia. And there, uh, one of the parts of the report actually deals much with the Russian military industry um, and its resources. Uh, so this is something we worked on with around 40 Russia experts in Finland, uh, and it gives a quite good overview of the current state of the industry today. But then, basic to the topic of the day. So today I'm going to talk about the workings and the current state of the Russian military industrial complex today. Um, I'm going to start off by giving a short uh, description and a definition of the military industrial complex and then go a bit into the historical development because I think the history is very interesting um, because we can draw many parallels actually between the Soviet military industrial complex and the complex today. Uh, I will also look into a bit of the recent developments uh, that have taken over recent years, especially in the uh, years following 2014. Uh, as well as demonstrate some of the key issues that are still prevailing in the industry. And one of the topics I've been especially looking into uh, in recent months uh, is innovation activity in the military industrial complex and how that is uh, coming about in these years. But then, just to basically de define what the military industrial complex is, uh, so the textbook definition we could just say is that it is an informal alliance uh, between the nation's military and the defense industry um, that supplies it. A driving factor behind this relationship is that basically um, the state obtains war weapons and the military industrial complex companies, um, they are being paid to supply them. And despite the fact that the militarization of societies actually goes much further back in history, uh, we can trace the origins of the military industrial complexes much to the times of the Cold War and a couple of some years before that. Um, because this is when they started to form not just in the Soviet Union, but also in Great Britain, France, um, the US and China. And what is actually specifically interesting is how much the development of the military industrial complexes went very much um, in parallel in the US and in the Soviet Union. But then, just shortly about the history, um, actually in the Soviet Union we could say that the development of the military industrial complex uh, took its first step forward in the 1920s. Um, because this is when among Soviet leaders there um, began to prevail a um, policy making with which uh, military production was promoted over investments in the civilian economy. And it was then um, in the 1930s uh, that large investments in the defense industry uh, were made and relevant practical development started from uh, 1931. And then during the war years of 1941 to 1945, um, there was a sharp grow in infrastructure of military production. And it was during this time that there interestingly also occurred a mass transfer of civil enterprises into uh, the military sphere. But then we could say that it was during the Cold War uh, that the military industrial complex um, became a leading sector of the national economy of the Soviet Union. Uh, this was much due to the strategic competition that was taking place with the US. Uh, and armaments development accelerated then um, between the 1940s and mid 1970s. And it was during this time that the main Soviet goal was to catch up, catch up with the US in the invention of the major strategic nuclear weapons. 
And in most kind of weapons, we could also say that the United States was in the beginning ahead of the Soviet Union uh, by maybe four to five years, um, with perhaps the sole exception being the intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, but the USSR uh, managed to catch up on this um, during the years that followed. Um, and it was also during these, um, these decades that there took place also the building of closed science cities uh, in the Soviet Union. And these actually took much um, of the activity in developing military technology, uh, nuclear reactors, and later on spacecraft. And then we could say that it was in the 1980s uh, that the defense sector then produced already 25% of the national GDP of the Soviet Union and around three-fourths of the R&D works um, in the economy. And uh, what was especially interesting is also like um, that we there was a very high amount of workforce working with the uh, military industry uh, and it also was very valued and it attracted much of the best workforce in the Soviet Union. But how this basically worked was um, that at the highest level we had the Council of Defense or the Defense Council that consisted of the highest party and military officials and they undertook decisions on the development and production of major weapon systems. On the middle level, we had the Military Industrial Commission uh, that consisted of an inner circle of the Council of Ministers. Um, and then below this, we had organs of military representatives, R&D facilities, and the previously mentioned closed science cities of the Soviet Union. Uh, what is also interesting in the Soviet R&D system is that um, the R&D activity was, was much separated from actual production activities and R&D was undertaken uh, only by specialized applied research institutes. But then what happened uh, when we come towards the late 1980s was that there were cutbacks made in the military industrial complex and in the late 1980s the Perestroika attempted to make restructuring events um, in which the civil enterprises uh, more of them were moved to the defense side in an attempt to kind of make them function better as the military industrial complex was very well organized. Uh, in the 1990s, however, uh, these restructuring attempts ended very soon um, among the collapse of the Soviet Union and this led to the military industrial complex becoming disintegrated. So industrial capacity was lost in the breakaway Soviet republics and many of the science cities went into decline. Um, the 90s turmoil also of the economy led to sharp cuts in defense um, spending and military production, uh, which led into the military industrial complex going into a prolonged state of uh, crisis. And we could say uh, that this continued all the way actually until the 2010s. However, first um, correcting steps, if we could say, were made in 2006 when the Military Industrial um, Commission was um, established in the Russian Federation and uh, the state order for armaments was restored. However, it was not until the implementation of the first state armament program, in other words, the GPV 2020, uh, that the output, output of the sector began to grow very rapidly. Uh, the document was approved at the end of 2010 um, by then President Medvedev and its implementation began in 2011. Um, and following this, the growth of the defense sector was almost 12% a year um, between 2010 and 2016. In 2017, uh, the growth then slightly decreased, um, which were, but it was still higher than in the rest of the manufacturing sector on average. And today, um, actually later figures demonstrate that the defense industry is estimated to account for around 5 to 6 percent of total industrial production in Russia, as well as 10 percent of total manufacturing in Russia. But then more into the actual workings of the military industrial complex. So we could say that today um, the complex basically works in six key areas. So there's aviation and space, shipbuilding, artillery and small arms, uh, war material, 
radio electronics as well as nuclear weapons. And basically how decisions are made is they come from the highest level, uh, so of the president, um, and decisions are then also taken by major figures of the Russian armed forces as well as the Ministry of Defense. Um, then we also have the Ministry of Industry and Trade, as well as other state industrial actors who play all a role in this. But basically, then uh, the objectives that the military industrial complex works on today. Um, President Putin has stated already back in 2012 that the objectives are to increase the supply of modern weapons and introduce a new generation of equipment to facilitate uh, the acquisition of advanced uh, scientific and technological capabilities, as well as to develop and master new critical technologies for the manufacture of competitive military products. And how this is carried out then is um, the Federation has a number of different uh, strategies uh, that are being pursued. Uh, some of the key documents are the ones that are listed here. Uh, the most um, important of these is perhaps the state armament program um, and the development of the Russian armed forces actually in terms of the military material is carried out under this specific program. Uh, these are basically 10-year documents. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned, was approved in late 2010 and the implementation began in 2011. And these are updated every five years following an interim review. They are approved by the president and they set out the plans for, first of all, acquisition of new weapons. Uh, secondly, the modernization uh, and repair of existing uh, military equipment. And thirdly, the research and development for the creation of new systems. Uh, so far, there have been devised two programs, uh, the first of which, um, as I mentioned, um, the implementation began in 2011, uh, and the second program was approved in 2017 after some delay. Uh, what is worth noting is that these documents actually are classified in nature, and thus they cannot be reviewed directly. Uh, but there is much evidence in the public domain, including statements of senior officials, um, which allows a detailed analysis of them. Of GPV 2020, uh, the major goal has been to increase the proportion of modern weaponry uh, to 70% of all weaponry supplied to the armed forces um, by the year 2020. And at the beginning of the decade, um, the figure was only about 10% uh, for conventional weapons and a modest 20% for nuclear weapons. But for the time being, it looks um, like this achievement will be achieved by 2020. Meanwhile, uh, the GPV 2027 is expected to build on the progress made under GPV 2020, and it will further strengthen and modernize the Russian armed forces. Um, it is likely to focus on force um, mobility and deployability, uh, military logistics, as well as strengthening command and control systems. Uh, in addition, emphasis is likely to be based on the standardization and optimization of existing systems. Um, and then we could, we, I think we will see streamlining of priority uh, technological developments that will now come about in future years. Also worth highlighting is the state defense order uh, that was mentioned before. So this basically is an annual document. It brings together all the contracts between the defense industry contractors and the Ministry of Defense for the procurement of weapons and R&D uh, to be implemented during the following year. And this is approved by a government degree annually, and the funding of its implementation forms a part of the federal budget uh, chapter on national defense, uh, which covers all the military activities of the Ministry of Defense. I would also like to highlight the importance of the military doctrines of the Russian Federation um, because these contain the main provisions of the Federation's military policy and of the military um, economic support for state defense. Uh, the most recent revision of the military doctrine was approved in 2014, if I remember correct. And as you can see uh, in the citation here, 
uh, the doctrine actually also has a part that specifically focuses on the development of the defense industry. Worth also highlighting is the development strategy of the military industrial complex, um, which was approved in 2016 and updated earlier this year. And this basically sets the goals uh, for the military industrial complex, um, including now um, in this version, um, increasing industrial production, increasing the share of innovative products, as well as increasing labor productivity. But then, to understand also the structure of the military industrial complex, uh, it is important to take a look at the key corporations that we have um, acting today, as well as uh, the companies that operate under them. And the corporate structure of the sector is actually very interesting because it changed much at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, because this is when large state holding companies began to form. And after that, um, ownership has been increasingly centralized. Uh, the state corporations have been established, um, and these basically are six um, today. So these include the air defense company, Alma Sante, the air bu uh, aircraft builder, OACO, the shipbuilding uh, corporation, OESCO, and the conglomerate, Rostec. Furthermore, space-related activities are centered under Roscosmos, and then the nuclear weapons and energy technology with Rosatom. Uh, however, what is important to note here is that even though many of these corporations produce around 80 to 100 uh, percent of their products for military use, um, Rosatom and Roscosmos make exceptions here as they are mostly oriented towards the civilian sector. In total, the mentioned corporations employ today an estimated total of about 1.3 million employees and also the actual figure for the whole industry has been estimated before at 2 million employees. However, one matter worth noting is that um, in October last year, a deal was approved by um, the Russian president for the OACO to be acquired from the uh, federal agency for straight, uh, state property management by Rostec. Um, and this transfer is estimated to be completed now within 18 months, so later next year, if all goes according to schedule. Uh, since early 2018, there have also been rumors uh, around the potential absorption of OSCO by Rostec, uh, but so far I believe that this uh, matter has not progressed. Then, going one level down uh, from the corporation level, and there fall under each of them a number of companies, um, tens or even hundreds. Actually, under Rostec today, there are 100 companies. And however, officially in the record for the whole defense industry, last year, uh, statistics showed that it's uh, 1,355 companies in the register. Uh, and out of these, um, Rostec actually employs um, over half a million people. Uh, nevertheless, what is interesting is that only 65 major companies account for almost 85% of the total production in the defense sector, uh, and 26 of these are actually part of Rostec. Uh, 13 are part of Roscosmos, and 13 belong to um, other Ministry of Industry and Trade clusters, and lastly, 13 belong to other administrative sectors. The one topic that um, I've been specifically interested in in my research is the innovation activity that's taking place in the Russian military industrial complex today uh, and how basically this is structured. So we could say that uh, R&D activity takes place between all of these actors. Um, over recent years, it's also interesting to note that innovation activity has been moving up a lot on the state agenda of the Russian Federation um, as between the years 2010 and 2017, the government actually approved over 50 official documents related to technology, research, and innovation. In addition, uh, the state has invested substantial amounts in its science base, as well as ambitious programs uh, that strive to create high-tech research and innovations. Um, 
What is also interesting about the innovation activity is that over recent years there have emerged new innovation actors in the military industry, which, um, and we can still say that the key actors for innovation activity are within Russia's senior political leadership, the military and the defense industry. Um, but we could say also that still today the research activity tends to be much separated like in the Soviet times with the companies pursuing a limited amount of research over um, state organs. But the most significant innovation, innovation organs that have emerged over the few, past few years, um, so basically already in 2006, uh, the VPECO was uh, established and after that the FPI. So basically the um, VPECO or the Military Industrial Commission um, is um, directly re reliable to the Ministry of Defense, as is also um, the Russian Foundation for Advanced Research, or shortly the FBI. Uh, but the difference between these two is that FBI is actually much more focused on high-risk, long-term research projects and development activity, while um, the VPECO that then consists of cabinet members um, and key decision makers in Russian policy, uh, it serves more as a coordination platform uh, for the defense industry, armed forces, and the Ministry of Defense. And since 2007, it has also had the important task of producing the state defense order that we heard about a bit before. But meanwhile, uh, the FPI, um, it's the newer actor. It was formed in 2012. Uh, operating under the Ministry of Defense and responding directly to the VPECO. Um, it is often considered the Russian equivalent uh, for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or shortly DARPA, that was formed in the US in the 1950s. And it is actually tasked with, um, we could say, promoting research and development um, involving a high, risk, high degree of risk in the military um, technical technological as well as socio-economic spheres. Um, it's also tasked with developing and creating innovative technologies and produ producing high-tech military products for dual-use purposes. In addition, its mandate has been said to include um, bridging existing gaps in R&D with uh, Western countries, analyzing risks related to technological backwardness as well as um, dependencies on other states, as well as informing the Russian leadership of projects that could be used to achieve technological superiority. As a matter of fact, uh, President Putin has hoped that the Foundation's projects could lead to the development of weapons and equipment that could form the basis for Russian armament system at the term of um, 2025 and 2030, um, both for the armed forces as well as the other security forces. Um, and today, uh, we could say that the FBI's research focuses on uh, three key areas. These are chemical, biological, and medical projects, physical and technical projects, as well as information projects. Uh, the time horizon for these projects is quite long. Um, they're saying 15 to 20 years. Um, and this is the time during which only demo prototypes are produced. Um, and in 2016, it was stated um, by the head of the FBI that the fund was working on around 46 large projects. Um, and when the fund was actually founded in 2012, uh, it was estimated that in the nearby years, it would reach around 150 different projects. Uh, what is interesting is that the ideas for these new projects are often uh, collected through different types of competitions. And this is also being used as a way to get young people into the uh, industry uh, who are actually much needed at the, this point. Uh, and Russian sources, um, basically just shortly about the FBI's budget, have indicated that it could range between three to four billion rubles uh, per year. But then, uh, in recent years, uh, we also have the innovation centers that have um, become let's say, a um, popular phenomenon in Russia, as the Russian political elite has been very passionate about allocating uh, considerable resources to creating various innovation centers. 
Uh, it has been hoped that by creating this type of cluster type uh, environments, uh, it would make it easier and faster to come up with new innovations. Uh, the most famous of these centers is uh, the Skolkovo Innovation Center that was established in 2011 in the Moscow area and it has received a considerable amount of state funding. Uh, the project's managing entity has been the Skolkovo Foundation uh, that has been charged with um, providing the catalyst for the diversification of the Russian economy. Uh, and it basically works in six key areas, um, which are, sorry, five key areas, which are IT, energy, nuclear technologies, biomedicine, as well as space technologies. Uh, however, after its funding, um, the final outputs of Skolkova have been only a fraction of what was initially expected and there has been some criticism also from the Russian scientific community uh, towards the state for not allocating resources to already established uh, research institutes. Um, and also one major challenge that um, has emerged, it seems like also the government um, Funding for Skokvo is a bit drying out, as in recent years, additional funding has been sought from foreign venture capitalists. Uh, what is interesting is that a representative of the Skokvo Foundation, Foundation's investment fund, uh, Skokvo Ventures, uh, actually stated last year that around 41% of all venture investment in Russia is in Skokvo companies. Then uh, another interesting um, innovation center that has only recently emerged, uh, and we could say is a more uh, defense-oriented player, is the innovation center ERA that is located on the coast of the Black Sea uh, in the city of Anapa. Uh, and this was partly opened last year. Um, it's basically to carry um, innovation activity in close cooperation uh, with the Foundation for Advanced Research, or the FBI, that I mentioned before. Uh, the Innovation Center is basically to take over an area of 17 hectares uh, in Anapa and gather together over 2,000 um, researchers and engineers by 2020. Whether this will happen, uh, we will still see. And even though, um, but nevertheless, even though still being partly under construction, the Russian military is already sending soldiers from the science and technology detachments to start work there. And what is ERA's main purpose is it wants to serve as a research cluster uh, for the military industrial complex. Um, and the main focus is on developing um, breakthrough and especially dual use technologies, as well as um, developing basic and critical military technology. Uh, the research is basically uh, divided into eight different fields which include uh, notably, for example, computing and artificial intelligence systems, uh, robot structures, as well as supercomputers. Uh, then we could also say that the academic institutions, uh, they play a certain role in the military industrial complex, um, along with the military um, industrial complex's own companies. Um, in relation to academic institutions, um, it's interesting um, because like um, the FBI, um, it seems to be using a lot of the competition approach uh, to finding um, new ideas. Uh, students in actually Russian, um, both civilian and military academies and universities were invited, for example, last year um, to take part in the design challenges that were related to unmanned underwater vehicles as well as unmanned ground vehicle um, biathlons. Uh, the goal is basically to identify promising talent um, that could then be employed to work, especially with military robotics. Uh, one interesting joint project that I could also mention from the university sector is the University of Information Technologies, Mechanics and Optics uh, from St. Petersburg and the Far Eastern Federal University from Vladivostok have in recent years been focused on developing artificial uh, an artificial intelligence project uh, that is focused on the use of neural networks for the management of nuclear power plant systems. Then a bit about the companies still, um, we could say that the companies do pursue some R&D activities, but in nature these are very limited. 
Um, if we look at actually the financial statements of the companies uh, that have been uh, uh, put public, um, these demonstrate that the R&D expenditures of the turnover, or as a percentage of the turnover, are usually only under 2%. So these are very, very marginal. Um, however, it should also be noticed that um, doing research on this um, has in recent couple of years become a bit more challenging, as in 2017 there was passed a law change um, that now uh, gives the defense industry companies uh, the more possibilities to actually not publish financial statements annually. But then, to understand some of the recent developments uh, of the military industrial complex, uh, we of course need to take a look at the time following the 2014 crisis, um, the sanctions that emerged then, as well as the import substitution programs of the Russian Federation. So basically since 2014, the defense industry has suffered from two major external shocks, uh, the breakdown of collaboration with Ukraine, as well as the international targeted sanctions on the defense industry. Um, consequently, import substitution programs have come to play a new role in the industry. Um, however, it, it must be noted that um, import substitution measures were taken even before the events of 2014. Uh, for example, in 2013, the government uh, approved a decree um, that involved a ban on the ban and restrictions on the purchases of goods originating from foreign countries destined for the needs of the country's defense and security sector. Uh, the decision on the import substitution on the scale of the entire Russian economy was made at the highest level in August 2015, um, which is when the government of Russia issued a decree on establishing a state commission on import substitution. And basically how this works is that it is composed of two sub-commissions uh, one dealing with the civil spheres of uh, the economy and the other with issues pertaining the defense industrial complex. Um, and, but yeah, then going more into the Russian exports and um, imports that were taking place before, so we can say that Russia's arms imports um, for the defense industry, um, there have been then, but then it's not only reliant on those. So Russia mainly uh, does import dual-use technology uh, and components, uh, but the, um, and the dependence on foreign components increased actually gradually throughout the 2010s as Russia also intensified cooperation with its Western partners. And the foreign components um, that have been required for Russian weapons um, have been aimed both at Russian weapon systems um, for the Russian armed forces, as well as uh, weapons that have been destined for export. Uh, the most difficult situation uh, concerned the replacement of the Ukrainian products. At the time, uh, relations between the two countries um, started to deteriorate. Uh, military cooperation was actually at a pretty high level, if we can say. So until 2014, Russia was importing, for example, helicopter engines, um, ship um, engine turbines and electronic components from Ukraine. And what happened was basically two import substitution programs were launched um, um, by Russia, one for Ukrainian subsystems and components and the other aimed at EU and NATO countries as Russia previously imported especially microelectronics and machine tools for the industry. Substitution can be said to have basically two logics. Um, so substitution by local production as well as substitution by imports from elsewhere. Uh, some say there is also a third way that is related to simply uh, freezing development projects. Uh, but the degree of success in replacing uh, imports varies. Um, progress has been made, uh, but replacing products with mainly uh, domestic production is also a very slow process that takes to implement. Um, what I would also like to highlight, um, as discussed before, when talking about innovation activity, uh, there has emerged much pressure to create these new 
um, breakthrough technologies. And what is interesting uh, is that actually um, Russia's activities in Syria, which began in 2015, have also played a key role uh, in the de development of new products, as Syria has been basically used as a testing platform for several new weapon systems. Actually, it was in March um, this year that Defense Minister Shoigu said at a meeting of the Duma Defense Committee that Russian troops have tested more than 316 uh, new or modernized weapons in Syria. Uh, some of these products actually have not even been um, or gone through their normal testing cycles before testing in Syria. And consequently, some of them have also then um, been rejected later. Then what is worth noting is also the move from the GPV 2020 to the GPV 2027. Uh, we could say that the 2010s as a whole um, could be considered a success for the arms industry of Russia as uh, the modernization of a broad range of weapons um, has progressed. Um, however, the main issue remains the production of completely new weapon systems uh, that has remained behind schedule. Um, basically, the resources required to develop and that have been um, underestimated and the ability of the industry to move from prototypes to actual serial production of products has been overestimated. And the normal planning cycle uh, would have meant that the second armament program would actually already have started in 2016 and ran to 2025, uh, but due to the uncertain economic outlook of the Russian economy, uh, the start of the program was postponed until 2018. And like its predecessor, the new program uh, will have a planned total funding of around 19 trillion rubles. Um, but because the GPV 2027 is also much more limited in scope than the GPV 2020 was, uh, it is more likely that it will be also fully funded. We then to go into the key issues um, of the industry. So um, it is also likely that many of these will continue to prevail uh, during the 2020s. Um, one major issue has been um, the profitability and other financial struggles of the military industrial complex companies as the sector still consider, continues to um, uh, suffer from low productivity as well as low profitability. Uh, compared to um, Western competitors. Uh, this can be set, seen mostly when looking at the financial statements of the companies. Uh, and the defense industry is pretty much characterized by a high dependence on government budgets and have only a small number of private investors. Uh, the decision taken by the government in late 2016 to write off approximately 800 billion rubles in loans uh, granted to companies in the defense industry has eased some of the debt burden, uh, but it will not solve the productivity and profitability problems of the sector. Uh, in early 2018, uh, the Deputy Defense Minister Yuri Borisov um, proposed that the MIC companies uh, would start collecting more private investments uh, and would start um, issuing shares um, but many actually from the defense industry um, re objected this idea, citing both economic as well as security reasons. Uh, another major structural issue of the industry um, is related to corruption, uh, which remains one of the main structural issues of the industry. Uh, in 2011, Russia's then chief military prosecutor, Sergei Fridinsky, estimated that on average a fifth of the military hardware budget in Russia is stolen um, by officials um, and contractors each year. And corruption in the armed forces and defense industry uh, could also be said to take place um, on different levels. Uh, and it is most often associated um, with fraud, the maintenance of real estate buildings of the Ministry of Defense, as well as the misuse of these properties and construction contracts related to them. Uh, the secrecy, the lack of competition, and undisclosed conflict of interest associated with the sector also tend to promote further corruption. Uh, the costs that basically occur from this are undelivered orders, 
uh, higher prices products for products as well as the need to purchase some products from abroad. In May 2018, the Moscow Times um, published an article uh, where they said that the spending violations uncovered by a state auditor uh, had reportedly doubled in Russia during the year with the defense and space industries actually accounting for the majority of misspent funds. One of the long-standing issues is also the intellectual property rights of the industry, uh, which are still said to not have completely reached uh, West Western standards. Uh, problems with these are manifold. Um, they concern both the assignment, the enforcement, as well as the specification of the IPR. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, lack of a tradition of private property ownership and consequently the underdevelopment of the legal framework um, governing IBR has had major adverse also on the commercialization of R&D outputs. What is worth also mentioning um, is the vertical integration that has been taking place in the industry in the 2000s. Uh, as some say, this has also <coughs> extended to a level of it being too much. Also, even leaders in the MIC seem to be realizing now that the restructuration um, pursued in 2000s around big state corporations and the consortia has not brought about the hoped for results. And vertical integration basically means that uh, competencies are arranged in a way that ensures fully integrated production processes. And this means that there is very little, if any, subcontracting. Um, sure, this makes it easier um, to uh, main control, maintain control over these companies, uh, but this could be also um, hampering product development activity. Um, then, as mentioned, uh, also there has been a breakdown of military cooperation with the West, um, which has had um, some slowdown impact, especially on the industry. Uh, the effects of the sanctions began to be more felt in 2015 to 2016, uh, when Russian reserves and stocks um, began to run out, and contracts signed with Western companies before uh, 2014 began to expire. However, um, experience has shown that the position of Western countries in this matter is not uniform, as some terminated cooperation, uh, while others have opted to continue. Um, but then, basically, what comes next? Uh, it is clear that the current Russian political and military leadership has strong preference for risky and ambitious innovation projects um, that they hope will translate into breakthroughs in the defense industry. And it is thus likely that the government will continue to bring about and implement major ambitious technological programs as we have seen in selected priority areas. Uh, what comes to the industry shape, um, instead of continuing with vertical integration, it seems likely that instead uh, more horizontal integration will take place uh, now with Rostec continuing to take over uh, new actors. It might be that the uh, corporation Almasante actually will be bought and integrated either into Rostec or Roscosmos in the years to come. And in order to improve the financial situation of the companies, um, coming up with dual-use technologies uh, is also important. And the Russian defense industry will also have to go more into arms export, um, which it already pursues at a high level. Uh, one of the primary goals of the ongoing state armament program is to grow innovation activity in the defense industry with a special focus on dual use technologies. And the government has repeatedly actually warned uh, companies that the volume of military procurement will not keep going on forever which means that this is why the civil sector will be much needed. And already in 2016, President Putin suggested that the civilian production should cover 30% of the total production of the military industry um, by 2025, and as much as 50% by 2030. However, um, before the beginning of the state armament program, approximately one-third of the total output of the defense sector was intended for um, civilian use. How this expansion into the civilian sphere will happen remains also a bit unclear. 
um, those more in favor of a state-controlled industrial policy consider that major state-owned corporations and governments should remain the control here um, in order to uh, keep also security concerns in control. Um, in contrast, uh, supporters of more open markets would like to increase competition and open the sector up by attracting new investors uh, through privatization. And it's interesting to see whether this will progress in the upcoming years. But then looking more into the actual innovation um, activity areas that Russia is um, primarily working in now, uh, a couple of ones that I would like to highlight uh, is robotics, as the robotization of the armed forces is uh, seen to progress in the upcoming years. And the Russian Federation has set a goal with its rob robotization program to close the gap with the West by the end of the next GPV. And the development and production of robots in the country is currently being undertaken by the FBI. Uh, under which um, there was created a separate structure in 2015 that focuses specifically on robotics. Uh, the main efforts in the field of ro robotics are aimed at developing combat robots. Uh, actually, one of the first projects that the FBI came up with uh, in 2013 uh, was titled The Future Sh Soldier. And the main objective is basically to replace soldiers on the battlefield with these ones. Uh, then going into artificial intelligence, um, as pointed out before, uh, the president's statements on technology have recently been focused around the idea of creating technological breakthroughs, and these have been most notably focused on artificial intelligence. Uh, the Foundation for Advanced Studies has been told to have long-term projects in the field of um, artificial intelligence. And actually a very interesting uh, point last year was when there was her held for the first time a conference on artificial intelligence in Russia that was organized in cooperation by the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Education and Science, and the Russian Academy of Sciences for um, both domestic and international developers and users of AI. Um, and after this, actually, the Ministry of Defense then came out with a 10-point plan for uh, developing artificial intelligence in the mili military sector. Uh, and I think out of this, a couple of points are worth highlighting. So there has emerged an idea of forming a consortium that would work with big data analysis and artificial intelligence, combining the efforts of the scientific, educational, and industrial organizations. So basically, we're seeing more interest for actually having all these different actors play together and create ideas together. Um, another important point, I think, is also that there. one of the points was that um, an AI lab would basically be built in the ERA Technopolis Center that I mentioned before, uh, as well as uh, the FBI has been tasked with establishing a new national center for artificial intelligence. One interesting uh, area is also the space industry uh, and the changes that might take place there over the upcoming years. Um, and basically, um, the Russian military doctrines already indicate uh, that they view space as an important um, sector to modern warfare, and Russia has already developed uh, robust and capable space services, including space-based intelligence, surveillance, surveillance and reconnaissance um, systems. Um, and some also international actors have recently voiced concerns uh, about Russia also developing lasers and other types of anti-satellite weapons. But then, just to uh, conclude all of this, uh, so in spite of the difficulties that um, we have still seen in the 2010s, I would say that um, this decade can be considered as a whole a success to the Russian arms industry, as during 2010 to 2017, uh, many companies in the sector actually rose from their previous situations, but still today um, issues continue to exist, due to limited competition, low productivity, as well as many old structural problems. Uh, the GPV 2020, it has basically helped to revitalize uh, sections of the Russian defense industrial complex, um, and we will also see GPV 2027 doing the same now. Uh, but I think like what is crucial also is like doctrinal development is necessary 
uh, for the effective use of the new ARM systems that are emerging and also still the innovation uh, conditions uh, need to be improved. Whether Russia can deliver success uh, in defense innovation thus depends on many different actors. Um, but innovation su success, I would like to highlight, would not only result um, in a stronger um, Russian armed forces, but it could also help with the modernization of all Russian industry. And the, therefore, uh, the importance of defense innovation in a country like Russia clearly cannot be underestimated. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Uh,